Okay, well, we are good to go. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our bi-weekly builder's call. Today, we're going to talk a few minutes of just a general protocol update, and then we want to get into suppliers. Uh, so protocol-wise, uh, space has passed. This is the proposal that is going to allow us to increase the block size um, and also increase the amount of relays uh, required to submit a claim. So what this does is it actually reduces the amount of bloat that will be on the chain while also increasing the block size so that uh, we can actually have more gateways entering the ecosystem. So we're actually talking to quite a few gateways. I was just on a meeting with uh, uh, folks this morning and it's really exciting stuff. So really excited about where the gateway space is going with Shannon and space is gonna make that possible. So awesome job, everyone who participated in either uh, working on the research for that or getting it passed in the doubt. Testnet uh, or private testnet has launched. Uh, the private testnet is about quick iterations. It is about breaking stuff. Uh, so because of that, it's not open for everyone because that would include too many parties uh, when we need to reset something or when something needs to be tested and something breaks. Uh, when you have too many mute moving parts, uh, it can make having quick iterations difficult. So the private testnet is about quick iterations. It's about breaking stuff and it's about establishing the basics of what Shannon would be. It already launched, we've already tested uh, some claims, suppliers set, submitting claims. So it's kind of that level of thing where we're looking at the very basic parts of it, seeing how it works. And then uh, the public testnet will be where the foundation is laid and people can start joining, people can start building, uh, and people can start testing within an environment that they pretty much know is established. And so we are actually going to be releasing public facing user friendly explorers. Uh, they're currently being deployed by community members and some modifications are being made right now to them. The great thing about Shannon is it works with the Cosmos SDK because uh, it is the Cosmos SDK. So we actually have folks deploying explorers that already exist within the Cosmos ecosystem and they just simply forked it and deployed it themselves, connected it to Pocket, and it started working. So that's just an awesome example of the kind of thing that's now going to be possible with Shannon that was not possible with Morse. We have so much more tools available to us because it's on the proper Cosmos SDK. That's basically Shannon, where we're at with the protocol development. Now I want to get into a little bit of the theoretical kind of what we're what we're thinking about what like areas that i'm personally researching as a uh, part of helping the protocol team and so today we want to focus on suppliers so before we can get an idea of what shannon will look like for suppliers i wanted to give a quick overview of what morse looks like for suppliers so in order to generate uh average rewards a supplier is required to run essentially 15 chains. They have to do that in three different regions, basically three different continents. Um, the monthly cost, now this obviously varies depending on the node provider. Uh, some are super efficient, some aren't as efficient. And so this is, this is all just theoretical, but you understand the fact that it takes a lot to be a provider. So you have a hardware cost of let's say around 8,000. Uh, your monthly rewards, is going to be around $80 uh, dollars a month. And then the number of nodes that uh, you're going to have to run in order to break even is around 100 nodes. So to do 100 nodes, uh, you're looking at essentially a million dollars just to break even on your infrastructure, meaning you're bringing in around $8,000 a month to break even on your costs. Like this is to show how off currently Shannon is. Now, providers, obviously, they're not providing a million dollars of their own income to stake it on pocket. They are able to provide, you know, a lot of pocket access to their service, and then they keep a percentage of it, right? So that's why, you know, 100 nodes, there's a lot of providers that are literally serving over 1,000 nodes. Uh, and so then they get a small cut of that. But it, it just goes to show the amount of resources that if someone knew was going to enter the space, these are the things that they would have to do in order to be successful. The reason that Morse is operating the way that it is, is really because of like two main elements that are alive in Morse. 
Number one is max chains. With max chains being at 15, that basically means this is how many chains you have to run to get network average. So the reason someone has to run 15 is because of this parameter. Uh, and then the reason that someone has to run nodes in three different regions is because of geomeshing. Now, providers, uh, some providers were doing geomeshing. If folks remember a few years ago, uh, certain providers just had their rewards exploding and no one knew why. And it was because they had figured out geomeshing with a private client. Pocket Scam open sourced it. They they backward engineered kind of what was going on. They open sourced it. And uh, uh, now the whole network does geomeshing. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with geomeshing. And the fact that Pocket Scan open sourced it was phenomenal because it allowed everyone to be on the same uh, playing field. But the idea of geomeshing makes it so you have to run your nodes in three different regions in order to get network average. So ultimately, it created a lot more requirements on suppliers, which is what leads to the $1 million worth of uh, pocket you have to own in order to just break it even per month. So what this did as a whole is it uh, you no longer have in, an independent node running community. Um, basically, most of the folks running nodes right now are providers, and they're also the ones uh, very active in the chats talking about nodes. Uh, you don't have a lot of independent people talking about nodes in, in our community anymore. That wasn't necessarily the case uh, a while ago. Yeah, we had a very active kind of independent community, but the economics favor those in kind of the provider position. It has also uh, prevented chain specialists from joining Pocket. So say someone is specialized in Solana and they run Solana nodes, they understand Solana nodes. They can't just join Pocket and get meaningful rewards or get network average rewards because they also have to run 14 other chains in three different regions. So it, it's a huge barrier to entry of someone who's potentially already specialized in an area and they can't just monetize their knowledge in pocket without also having a huge infrastructure burden and having to specialize in 14 other nodes. And so this also means that other chain, uh, other chains, their node running communities can't join pocket. Uh, and this actually plays into my last point here. Uh, adding new chains is dependent on existing node runners. Back in the day when we were launching Avalanche, when we were launching Harmony, I was part of those, uh, I was doing business development uh, for PNI at the time. And uh, one of the exciting things is those communities were joining Pocket because they're like, oh, cool. Like I can run, you know, a node for Avalanche, which I'm passionate about Avalanche. Uh, and now I can monetize it. Uh, and then people that were already running Avalanche nodes were then buying Pocket nodes to monetize it further. And so it created a great synergy uh, between our ecosystems. That's kind of fallen apart now because uh, of the complexity of joining uh, the Pocket network. Uh, so that's something that we want to address. And we want Pocket to ultimately be able to tap into other node running communities, especially when we're adding a new chain. Adding a new chain, why not get all their node runners onto Pocket, and then they can be the ones to run the initial infrastructure for their chain, versus right now, Grove has to pay someone to run infrastructure. Uh, they have to pay a provider to run infrastructure for them to kind of bootstrap and get initial nodes on the protocol. So that's that's the state of where Morse uh, is today. Now, what we want to do with Shannon is obviously we want to open this up. We want to make it so anyone can generate network average uh, with Shannon. So in this case, uh, we're looking at the number uh, the number of chains could be potentially one here. Um, and the reason is, is we either won't even have a max chains parameter or it'll uh, just be set to something like one. Um, but just simply having that parameter act differently in Shannon suddenly reduces the need to run so many chains. Also, we're looking into uh, essentially doing regions where you can't geomesh. Uh, geomeshing would be impossible. This would allow anyone who's running a node at their own home, a node uh, professionally somewhere, they don't have to be in three regions, just one region, wherever they're at, they could start monetizing their infrastructure. Because if you have to think about joining Pocket, you then have to think about, okay, well, I need to run my infrastructure in a completely different way in different regions. That's going to bar 90% of people from even wanting to consider Pocket. If Pocket's uh, value proposition is if you're already running a data source, already running something like a, uh, a blockchain node, 
wherever you're at, you can monetize it. That's huge value proposition. Uh, and so the the hardware cost could be anywhere from you know zero to maybe two hundred bucks. Uh, zero if you're already running it uh, for your own business, running it on your own, what have you. You can just monetize it on top of your existing business. Uh, you can generate you know eight dollars a month if it, if we're uh, talking about the network average. And uh, you know you to break even, you know you maybe need one, two, maybe three nodes. Now that all just depends on what your hardware cost is. But ultimately, you're looking at a significant lower buy-in. And this is also staked Pocket. So, you know, most of the people that are joining Pocket want to hold Pocket so that they can uh, receive the upside of the network growing. So the advantages here is any node runner can join Pocket. You just need one Pocket node and one chain node to essentially generate network average. This allows specialists uh, to generate revenue by running Pocket nodes alongside the blockchain nodes they already run. Pocket can also be used for any data source. This is especially important when we're thinking outside of just blockchain RPC. What about LLMs? What about different types of indexing or custom APIs? Like there's all sorts of things, you know, Pocket is ultimately a general data protocol. Any data type can go through Pocket. It doesn't have to be a blockchain node. It can be anything, which is why we've talked a lot about LLMs in the forums. And that's a very heavy topic uh, because Pocket Protocol fits in perfectly with simply being able to connect people who want data to that data source and create an economic incentive for them. And so once you start getting into new data sources, you don't want an LLM to also have to run 14 other blockchains to receive network average. You know, like you you want to be able to just a specialist, a specialist in one area, monetize their node. And then providers in Pocket then become a feature, not a requirement. Uh, providers still, you know, serve the markets uh, with people who don't want to run nodes at all. They want to completely abstract away the need to run a node. That's awesome. That's exactly where providers come, uh, come into place, but it doesn't make providers required for the pocket ecosystem to operate. And uh, you can also have providers launch in very specific areas like, you know, chains. Like you could have providers that specialize in only one or two chains. And if you want to generate rewards from those chains, you go to, uh, you go to them. Uh, or if they specialize in something like LLMs, once we get new data sources, a lot of possibilities there. So I want to quickly then talk about kind of how we're looking at rewards, or at least how I'm looking at rewards uh, within Shannon, and kind of give you an understanding of where my mind's at. And right now within Morse, you have a breakdown of suppliers get 85% of the reward, uh, the DAO gets 10%, and validators get 5%. A new theory that uh, and a model that I'm building out right now and thinking through is sources, where uh, sources actually get part of the revenue. So what is a source? A source can be the client that a service ID is connected to. So say, okay, so right now we have uh, Polygon is the highest generating chain on Pocket today, right? Uh, the only people that receive rewards are the suppliers. However, the Polygon Foundation is maintaining their own nodes. They're, they're creating, improving on their nodes. They're, uh, they're working on the clients themselves, and yet they don't have any incentive to be on Pocket. Uh, the reason Polygon's on Pocket is simply because gateways needed access to it, but the foundation itself, like the Polygon Foundation, the Polygon team doesn't actually have any connection to Pocket. But what if we actually allowed those chains or really any data source that comes to Pocket the ability to also monetize and generate revenue from the traffic that's using their data source, right? Now it's still being hosted by suppliers, right? Suppliers are still hosting the Polygon nodes, but there's real resources going into building those data sources. Now in the case of Polygon, they're obviously a large chain, but what if new indexing technology Actually, I'll go ahead and move on to the next slide to kind of explain where all the incentives are with this. But um, basically, the idea is to allow those that are building data clients or building sources, whatever you want to call it, uh, they can generate revenue from Pocket. So this includes new chain foundations, as I mentioned. This could also be LLMs. Say someone comes up with a uh, specific LLM and trains it in a specific manner that uh, is able to provide really great uh, responses to a particular area, say like IT or uh, networking or something of that nature. And they're incentivized to actually bring it to pocket because then if more users access their LLM model, they actually can generate revenue from this. 
and this applies this this applies to far more beyond just blockchains as i mentioned llms this could mention indexers actually back in 2021 i was talking to the team about this kind of concept because uh at the time i was talking with uh an indexer and they had some really cool technology and i was trying to convince them to hey let's bring it to pocket but they were like why why does it matter if our technology is on pocket or not um and i didn't really have an answer for them and then that's where i talked to the team and i was just like hey we need to have a cut for sources because he should be incentivized to want to bring his technology to pocket because if it grows on pocket he generates revenue and so that's really where it kind of this idea was originally seeded because we want to incentivize people to come to pocket with their data source um, right now, if someone were to come to Pocket, because like right now, if that indexer would come to Pocket, they would have to come to Pocket, and then they would have to run it themselves, all the infrastructure themselves uh, for serving it. Or they'd have to run a gateway and uh, you know have this user-facing gateway for uh, developers to interact with. And they just didn't want any of that. That's not why they're building their indexing. They're not building their indexing to then have all these other responsibilities required to have it monetized. So if Pocket is already creating a way for suppliers to uh, generate revenue off of data sources, uh, it makes sense that the data sources as well get uh, generate some revenue there too. Um, so uh, I did some just kind of like napkin math, um, but the, but but if uh, we look at Pocket and possibly around twenty billion relays in just kind of my napkin math calculations, I believe we could become deflationary. Uh, and then at that point, you know, just to kind of give a reference of like some of what it could look like, you know, the Polygon Foundation could be generating twenty thousand uh, dollars a month simply for being on Pocket. Um, that's just a huge incentive to to want a partner because this is something where they don't have to do anything else other than continue what they're doing, and their incentives are already to, you know, build the best Polygon they can. We're not their incentive, but what a, what a great relationship that creates. And then this also think of other, you know, an exchange like Binance, they could be generating decent enough return just from being Binance and being a partner with us. So we want to create that ability for foundations or data sources, anyone to come partner with us, join Pocket. And if it takes off, if users start using your data source and suppliers are running it, you get part of the reward as well because they're also the ones adding value to Pocket by creating a data source that suppliers want to run and users want to access. So anywho, yeah, that's basically kind of the uh, the gist of it, of what I wanted to kind of give a deep dive about. Um, but anyways, any other uh, thoughts or questions? Uh, service slash chains whitelisting will be permissioned then. Um, it, it doesn't, no, it doesn't necessarily have to be permissioned um, on the adding a new chain. Um, what would likely happen is it would require a direct partnership with PNF to receive those rewards. So to receive the source rewards, you would have to partner with PNF. Um, we couldn't allow that to just be permissionless because uh, there could be potential gaming. Um, you could also potentially have people, uh, you know, getting the source rewards when they're not actually the one building the source. So an example of this was. If, uh, you know, someone were to start a uh, Ethereum, uh, you know, someone were to somehow claim, because it's permissionless, the Ethereum service ID when, you know, they're not actually the Ethereum foundation or they're not the builders building the clients, uh, we can't have something like that happen. So there has to be a little bit of vetting. All this is still early, but this would be something where it'd be more of a uh, permission thing with, uh, likely with PNF. Um, I'm sure there's a way to do it permissionlessly in the future, uh, but at least for now, this would, you know, be permission through PNF from at least my initial my initial thinking of it, just so we could potentially have this at launch without having too many technical hurdles. Um, make it permissioned with PNF, so a great opportunity to create partnerships between Pocket officially and these other either data sources or chain foundations. How is QoS affected or maintained? That's actually a great question. Um, there, there has been a narrative that uh, I've seen kind of around where you have to be a, a provider, a big provider in order to provide good quality of service. Um, that's actually a misconception and actually historically so that's inaccurate. So if you actually look at Grove, um, again, I've worked for PNI uh, many times in the past, uh, I've been a part of the ecosystem for a long time, and so Grove slash previously PNI, 
they when they run into quality of service issues, it's not because of an independent node runner. It's always been because a large node runner that has so much of the network under their control has an issue with a node or has an issue with a chain. It's never been from the small guys because a gateway themselves can already pick and choose which nodes they want to uh, send to. So when we had a lot of independent node runners, they actually had a lot of diversity with who they could uh, send relays to. Now, sure, some of them might not be good node runners at all, um, but like, for example, many of them were using NodePilot and NodePilot was creating no issue for uh, Grove or PNI. Like th there, was, there was no issues being created from people running NodePilot because they were running good solid blockchain nodes through NodePilot and their rewards were just as much as everyone else in terms of network average. So Grove was selecting them to send relays to. So anyways, that, that, that's a bit of a misconception. Now with other data sources coming online and all this stuff, uh, you actually don't want providers that hold huge amounts of the market under their control in the future, because that is what will create quality of service issues. The more diverse we have uh, in terms of more data servicers, that's fantastic. That adds so much to the protocol that then gateways can utilize. Thanks for joining everyone. Cool, cool. All right, take it easy, guys.